when people talk, because, you know, uh, referring back to the climate change in Copenhagen recently, uh, it seems like Africa got a raw deal at the end of the day. We thought, you know, Africa doesn't consume as much as, let's say, China or even the West. And yet we, we felt that we got kind of, you know, we got a raw deal. Is that true, really, at the end of the day? Uh, you know, I, I, I was at Copenhagen and our film, Hope in a Changing Climate, was, was screened there. I, I had a feeling that the negotiations really broke into two different discussions. There, there are broadly two types of discussions. And this is not really consensus. So, in, in the one hand, there are a number of countries uh, who have not been emitting large amounts of CO2 or other greenhouse gases. So, if you assume that human impact on climate change is really about CO2 emissions, then no, this is not where it's coming from. It's not coming from the poorer countries. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the industrialized countries and the f rapidly growing developing countries. But there is something else. We, what we've seen in this research is that actually human impact on the climate began long before industrialization, long before egregious emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. It, it's also caused by de degrading the landscape. So civilizations have completely failed. Greece, the Mayan Empire, the, the Yellow River civilization in the Luce Plateau was a failure. And so this alters the climate because evaporation rates change. Uh, rivers stop flowing throughout the year, but f flood during the rainy season and then are dry riverbeds in the dry season. That's a cli climate change. So what, what's interesting about this research is that we're seeing now, we're disrupting global systems. So degradation somewhere is degradation everywhere. That means that we can't, no one in the world, there's not us and them, there's just us. We're in this together. We can't degrade any land. And that any level of investment which is required to restore ecosystem function wherever land has been degraded is, is worth it. And once we do that, once we value soil fertility, we value water, we value biodiversity, hundreds of millions of people who are now poor will no longer be poor because they are the stewards of water, biodiversity, and soil fertility, which is of value. Right. So now it doesn't fit in the economy as we've, as we've defined it. Mm. But that just means the economy is false. It doesn't mean that it has to be this way. It means that we need to think our way out of this problem. Yeah. Many of our communities here in Kenya, Professor, charcoal burning, say, has been a way of life. Cutting down trees has been a way of life. Do we need to change that? Do we need to, to change people's thinking? Is that the bottom line? Absolutely. I mean, those behaviors must change. Those behaviors were okay with small concentrations of people and endless resources. But that's not the case now. So we need to look at this. What are the alternatives to this? Do we have technological alternatives? And the answer to this is absolutely. And you know, in my, in my research, if I go into, into the countryside and I see young girls and young boys and women walking long distances with, with sticks on their back or carrying water on their head in chemical buckets long distances, can we address this? Absolutely, we can address this. This must be addressed. Yeah. This, is, this is pointless labor for them. Mm. They mustn't continue to do that. So in order to do this, we have to answer water, food, and energy. If we answer water, food, and energy, there's no need for them to, to do this. They can study. In fact, from an ecological perspective, once you value water, soil fertility, and biodiversity, negative behaviors are, are, are negative. They're economically negative as well as ecologically destructive. So when I ask those people, would you, if, if there were an alternative 
to this, to burning charcoal, to carrying sticks and carrying water. If, if instead there was a way where you could participate in restoring ecosystem function, would you rather do that? They all say yes. Now this is not scientific, this is informal, but if I go and ask them, would you, would you rather, do you want your children to carry sticks and water? Or would you rather they were educated and, and, and developed in a different way that was sustainable? What would you prefer? They'll always say they prefer their children to escape from this, this trap of mm. poverty. Mm. We can't turn it around. Professor, I want to talk more about it. And also, this documentary, your latest one, Hope in a Changing Climate. Hopefully, it'll be airing on K24 real soon. I hope so. And the impact, of hopefully, will be, you know, I think people will be surprised to see that you can't turn it around. And also, the lessons of the low spleto. Yes. Unbelievable. Mm. Unbelievable. Ten years you can turn around an area the size of Rwanda almost. And also, what is it that keeps you going? That's, What's the yeah. ultimate? What's the ultimate? But first, we'll take a break. Okay. Because I know. <laughs> there is an ultimate. Good grief. Are you sitting back, Professor John Liu? I tell you, this is what we mean when we talk about the future of this country and this continent. Little issues that people don't discuss, but they're important because there are life-changing issues. If you destroy your environment, you destroy your population. That's the bottom line. But we can turn it around. There is a window. That's what we're talking about. That's the issue of the day on the bench. Don't even think of going away because Capital Talk is back.